And so, um, somebody if you wouldn't mind reading that for us, starting in verse number one. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. So I, I love, I love, I, I thought English on this as you were reading it. I kept hearing subject, what's the subject? He keeps saying he, right? It says, uh, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down. He leads me. He restores my soul. He leads me in path of righteousness. And then he says, here's the predicate, the one being acted upon. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod, your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me. So I just think that, again, the subject of David's writing is, is, is the Lord. And that's a blessing that you can identify and distinguish the Lord. Right? And this is, again, writing that is kind of, it's biblical, right? But this is the gathering of his, his life. This wasn't a scripture he read and came. This was like what came out of his guts, out of his experiences with God, he reflected in his Holy Spirit and wrote these words using his experiences, his knowledge, the way he views things, his looking at nature and all of those different things to try to explain what he has done, what God has done. And so this is how God uses his people. So again, I believe that though God is not writing another Bible, like the words you and I speak, generated by the Holy Spirit, are as much spirit and truth as this book that is written. God uses the instrument of human, human personality and personhood to communicate his very word. And so David is writing out of his experience, man. And again, we know his experience. It was a cat that was on the run. He blew it with God and was on the run and tried to figure it all out and all of these things. But there was a steadfastness, not in his own mind. He didn't keep himself with it. This was the Holy Spirit continuing to nudge him and help him um, lay hold of Christ. Um, Christ is elusive without the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you can't grab him. You can't, you can't find him. You can't locate him. You can't pin him down so that your soul can receive from him. There is a pursuit that we need. We do need to seek him. Like We need to search for him um, as if our life depends on him. But it is him by his spirit that causes himself. Uh, to be revealed. Uh, this, this reminds me of Song of Solomon. Song of Solomon, the lady is trying to like, I see him. The one who my soul loved, like there was this, I saw him, he passed by, but it was just like a longing, like that's what I'm looking for. And I think that that is the work of the Holy Spirit, man. And so for David to be able to um, distinguish who the Lord was out of his circumstances is big, but the piece that rose up for me that began a little trail of thoughts was verse five where he says, <clears throat> You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Now that's big because <clears throat> I actually don't want a table in the presence of my enemies. I'm actually praying for the Lord to deal with my enemies, crush them, if you will, or get me out of there, if you will. But the Lord said, uh -huh, that ain't how I'm going to do it. I'm going to set up shop and prepare a table and cause you a feast right in the presence of your enemies. So let's think about this for a second. What are enemies of God's people. What are those? What are the enemies that we have to contend with? We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but spiritual wickedness. Yes, sir. The, of the devil, the flesh, yeah. the, the world, world, and the world. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's our, our enemy, right? Mm -hmm. Like, I got an enemy that's already an enemy apart from Christ. I got a me that's subject to turn on God. I got a me that is that that wants to give ear to the enemy, that wants to pay attention to what the world is doing. Like I already want to cooperate with the enemy. It has to be the Holy Spirit to restrain me and keep me from what my natural tendencies would be. And so, but what he says, what I'm going to do is in the face of all of those.
those enemies, we're going to sit down. And so the thing that rose up for me and the Lord had me write down was uh, what he is after is a depth of communion, a focus, a stare down in the midst of all of the things that's going on. Like, I don't want you to run from, I don't want, I don't want to have to give you power just by having an absence of, because then that ain't really power. I want you to give you power in the face of it all. Right. And so, you know, our model has to start with Jesus, who did it perfectly, right? And so we know what that whole thing was. In the garden, the, the enemies of his soul, right? Him stepping into our place to face all of the retribution for that. Uh, his soul was in this place of, of an unflinching communion. The nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done, was facing the enemies head on and looking beyond them to the communion with the Father, right? And so that is where God um, works to take us, but the way to get us there is through our challenges. It's through our difficulties. We were talking about um, our own struggle, our own dilemma, our own blindness, our own failure to lean all the way in with God. But in that place, we found a sweetness that we couldn't have found just by being a good boy. Mm -hmm. It was in my error, in my wrong, in the enemies conquering me, giving me challenges to do what God wanted me to do, that God came and set up shop right there and didn't rush me out of that place, but gave communion in that place that um, helped me triumph over them to where this is. <clears throat> my enemies became my grasshoppers. Mm -hmm. when, when I was in the midst of it, without him overriding all, the enemies was giants. The world was big, what I didn't have, what I wanted, my lust was strong, like all of that stuff. My despair was strong because I didn't have what my flesh was, like all of those things um, was over. And it was like, this is what you feel. It. I'm just, I'm flailing, I'm falling. But when Christ showed up and he caused us to sit down at table with him, he, what he did is say, I know, don't look at that. Mm. Look at me. And he began to speak sweetly, Amen. softly. Gently to our souls, to where, listen to this, all the background noise came to us. Gotcha. The only thing that was happening was this, and in that place, in the midst of, so just imagine a cat in the midst of a war. And I'm talking about a war like they used to do it in the old days, when you got to run up on a cat, mm -hmm. <laughs> like it was like, we right. watching this clashing. Just right. imagine a cat sitting down in that place, at a table, with food spread, mm -hmm. <laughs> as if nothing ain't going on. Yeah. See, that's the piece that, that surpasses all of the study. It actually don't make no sense. Yeah. Only Christ can take us into that place, and he does it not by avoiding that place, but he said, no, right here, mm. let's sit at it. Mm. And let me show you the power of what it means to be in fellowship and communion. This is what I purchased for you. Salvation was to bring us to God. It wasn't just, oh, I'm going to heaven, I got my ticket. No, salvation was so that you and right now would begin a communion and a fellowship and a walk with God in a clear way that will lead in and all the way through eternity, uh, time after time. And so that begins immediately. And so this is what God wants people to taste, which is why he's saying, I need you to set up that restaurant in the wilderness. I don't want them to just think this is about heaven. Though heaven is a byproduct, I want them to taste and see right now, listen, with their current circumstances. And I got to let you taste it first. I told my boy today, I'm like, we got to get high off our own supply. Mm. Like, if we don't, mm. this don't work for us, right. why am I standing out here on the street corner right. sweating and all that as if it's going to matter to you, yeah. right? As if it hasn't happened for me first. And so mm -hmm. that's the place God wants to take us. So I'm going to read that one more time. It says, why the table in the midst of the dilemmas? Because he is after a depth of communion, a focus, a stare down in the midst of all that we're going through. So let's, um, let's look first at Matthew 14. Matthew 14. And then let's look at verse, let's start at verse number... 22. Immediately Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he sent the multitudes away. Stop for one second. I just want you to know that this that we're about to embark on and read is really kind of coming out of 
this experience that's in verse number 20. Jesus steps into an impossibility, and look what he says, and they all ate and were satisfied. See, again, that's what that peace is. That's that contentment. That is that I don't need to move. I don't need you to fix nothing. Like, whatever's going on around me, as long as I'm face to face with you, as long as I have feasted on you, my soul has what it needs. And so, this is about a sense of satisfaction and the comfort that Christ brings. And now he takes them out of their element to bring him into his element, right? Like, he makes, he disrupts so that he can comfort and kind of make things settle, right? Um, so, let's go ahead and finish up, uh, Brother Hesh. I know we just read 22. Verse 23, and when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up on the mountain by, by himself to pray. Now when evening came, he was alone there. But the boat was now in the middle of the sea, tossed by the waves, for the wind was contrary. Stop for one second. Notice again the model of Jesus. What I just picked up on that as you were reading it is that Jesus didn't just seek that communion and fellowship when things were haywire. There was just success. He just did the miraculous. We just fed, like I just, I just, I just have shown, I've just shown in another degree who I am, Father. Like we just, there's a victory for heaven again, a witness to humanity about the divinity that was in Christ. And so this was victory right now. And it says he went up to pray, right? Communion with the Father is not just, oh, I need you, I'm in hard time. Communion with the Father is, like, come in the midst of my good times so I don't get so hung up on my good times, mm -hmm. as if that's my refuge. Because mm -hmm. the times is going to change. Mm -hmm. And if I get too wrapped up in the good times, when the good times go, right. I'm back on, I'm, I'm disarrayed in. Mm -hmm. I don't want to find no footing on anything but the person of Christ. He is consistent whether my days is good, my days is bad. Whether I feel like I'm winning or I feel like I'm horribly losing. Listen to this. All of that is subject to change, but he is constant and he never changes no matter what our situation is. So again, that is a, a quick note that Jesus, even in the midst of victory, sought the Father's presence. Um, and now let's go ahead and keep, keep going, my brother. Verse 25, now in the fourth watch of, of the night, Jesus went to them walking on the sea. When Stop for one second. Do you know when the fourth watch is? It's like 3 o'clock in the morning. 3 o'clock in the morning. So it says right before that, uh, and after he dismissed the crowds, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. And when evening came, he was there alone. But the boat, by this time, was a long way from land, beaten by the waves. So, so they've been out there for a while, tossed to and fro. Right? So again, sometimes Jesus will leave you in the midst of the storm. He'll leave you for a minute because there, there is something in humanity that, um, like, he has to peel back the layers. He got to get us to the place of true desperation. He's like, it ain't bad enough yet. He's like, wait, hold it, hold. <laughs> like, not yet, because if you come in too soon, it's too easy of a victory. I, my soul ain't felt the trembling of. I got, no, I got no reason to be out here like this. I got no ability. I can't save myself to make it make me cry out with desperation. Like that's to get real. So God has to sometimes, this is why fellowship with him is so key and learning who he is and some of how he works. Well, I said one line in the song today. I said, um, uh, I always know who, but I don't know how. Right? I know who going to fix it. I don't know how, I don't know when, I don't know the way he's going to do it all, but I know who got my situation in his hands and who got the final say so over it. So as long as I can be reminded of that, that by the Spirit can communicate comfort to my son, can communicate, sit down, relax, like rest for a minute, like God got you. And so this is the place that the disciples find themselves in. We've been tormented for a while out here on the sea. And now Jesus waits till a little bit later on, as you said, three in the morning. Like that's a late, that's a late later than midnight hour, man. He may not come when you're on. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. But let's let's keep going, brother. Ash. Verse 26. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, and they were troubled, saying, "It is a ghost," and they cried out for fear. Stop for one second. <clears throat> Sometimes, and here again is what Jesus wants to teach us. Sometimes we're so overwhelmed by a situation that we can't recognize Jesus when he shows up. 
We can't recognize the way he might be working. We can't recognize that this actually is not uh, a bad thing. It's a good thing, <laughs> right? The tests and the trials, this is what the scripture says. All things work together for our good, right? So that has to be true no matter what happens. And so the way we find out is that true is if that happens to you, and if that thing that is horrible, terrible, never would have asked for it, if that thing brings you closer to God, sees his glory in a deeper way, that's a good thing. And listen to this, no matter what that thing was, it could be death, tragedy, lost job, move out that house, get like whatever that thing is, if that thing brings you closer in dependence on Christ, then that thing, listen to this, from God's vantage point, is a good thing. Like he don't, he don't spare what we have to go through in order to get the main lesson we need in this life. Um, this life is about, think about this. <clears throat> he said, the goal right now is that we will be conformed into the image of Christ. We will begin to look like, we will begin to listen to this, have the heartbeat of, and that's the main thing. What Christ came down and showed us um, in his humanity, like his divinity was doing what he needed to do in his humanity, part of what he was doing for us to show us this is what y'all was supposed to look like. Obedient sons and daughters, like children of God who do whatever the Father wants, like this. You don't have the power to do it, you broke it, but this is the goal for humanity. Sons and daughters who are, listen to this, submitted to the Father's will. So Christ came to put that on display, and so in this place, he is allowing the disciples to taste this, but the first thing we notice is that when Jesus does show up in their dilemma, their dilemma is a giant. Listen to this. And Jesus is real small right now. I don't know who that is. I'm actually the one I should be overjoyed that showed up. I'm scared because I don't know. I think it's something else. Um, and so this is, um, again, why I think that uh, there are certain teachers who wanted you to pass the class. Which is why you get an F on a certain test, they'll let you take it again. They weren't tripping on, oh, you got an F on that, it's over. There were certainty like, I want you to know the material. That's what God does for us. I want you to, I want you to get the, the lesson I'm trying to I'm trying to teach you how to trust in me. I'm trying to get you to model yourself in a certain way. And so, okay, you failed that one. We're coming back around so that you can get this, pass this test and really learn what faith is trying to teach us. And so that's where... Um, the disciples are in this moment. Jesus shows up. They can't recognize him. But look what Jesus does to speak into that, that place. Let's keep going. Verse 27. But immediately Jesus spoke to them saying, Be of good cheer. It is I. Do not be afraid. The word. The word is our comfort. <laughs> the word is what speaks me out of my delirium and my confusion, my worry, my anxiety, my forgetfulness, my uncertainties. It is his voice speaking to me. And listen to this. What we have to recognize is that in these days and times, um, it is his actual word, the Bible, printed paper, words on a page. But it is his, his servants speak on his behalf. Many times God is speaking that kind of light to a person in the limo through the instrument of a human that has been surrendered and so this is what happens for us. There have been so many people who have given me words of comfort, so many small things a person was saying that stood out because God let me hear it in a way that he was glorified in it and it communicated to my soul and, uh, and been in a place where God has used me to other people's witness to say what, I didn't even intend on saying that. I didn't think about that till that moment of life. Like, that wasn't me. That was God speaking to a person in the midst of their the dilemma um, to give them a, some level ground to stand on. So he says to them, but I love this phrase, but immediately, see, that's that, that's that heart of Jesus to comfort his children. That's what the scripture says. Comfort, comfort my people. I've already took the judgment on them. Listen, these cats should trust me right now, but they, they don't get it right now. So I'm apt to teach them. I'm apt to work in a way to bring them to a place to put their hope in me no matter what's going on. And so he immediately seeks to comfort his children, saying, take heart. Um, it is I. Do not be afraid. That's um, also big for me. It is I. There's not something he's bringing with him. That's the comfort. Mm -hmm. It's not what I'm going to do to get you out. Like, it's me. Before we talk about leaving where you are, the stuck that you're in, I just want you to know it's me on the scene um, 
and I am your comfort. I am Amen. your peace. Um, so do not be afraid because it's me. We ain't even talking about what we're going to do to get you out of this situation. It's just me here, and that's enough that even if we stay on the water a while, mm -hmm. this is a, you right, got what you right. need. Because if I'm with you, you can't go down. You can't, you can't go down. So let's, let's continue on. I think we're at 28. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. So he said, come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said to him, O oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? So let's stop for a second. So, so here is part of this lesson. Staring at Jesus, he's able to do the impossible. There's a power that is overcoming him to do what he cannot do. It is in a face-to-face -face stare down. This is, listen to this, the table in the wilderness, right? Many times um, in the Bible, um, storms, water, all of that represents the instability of life in this world. Right? Again, he's walking on something that can't be walked on. But you and I to walk out a life of gospel living in this world, that's impossible. To have your head focused on Christ, to be head over heels in love with him in the midst of living day to day and going to work and hanging out with people, living in the neighborhood, paying, like, all, like to have your eyes dead set still on Christ with all that that's going around us, that's impossible. But when he was in the stare down, he was able to do it, listen to this, with no problem. But the moment he got his eyes off of Christ and got concerned with what was happening around him, listen to this, Jesus became the whisper and the storm became real loud. The storm became a giant again and that's when all the power was gone. And so Jesus says, I have to teach you. And we know that's the heart of his lesson, which is, why did you doubt? It's the doubt. It's your unbelief. It's your failure to see me as enough to um, keep you um, being able to do what you can't do in your own. Like, it's me that gives you power, and that power um, comes without any, um, there's no power that can overcome that power. There's no power that can overcome the power of the gospel, the spirit, and God's word being active in your heart to keep you, listen to this, trusting, at peace, filled with joy, in the midst of uncertainties, I don't know, and feel like I'm losing, will I ever make it? Like, I got these realities on the outside, but there's some things speaking to me on the inside that let what happened on the outside not bother me. Not to the degree of despair or hopelessness. Um, let's, let's, let's just go, go, go with me right quick, 2 Corinthians. I think we picked on this, picked this up a couple of weeks ago. We read this maybe in the car last week when we, when we turned <laughs> 300 into a sanctuary. <laughs> Deacon Richards said we, we, we did that, man. <laughs> to the yes, glory Lord. of the King. Amen. Amen. So, uh, verse, uh, chapter 4, verse 7. He, again, here he's talking about this power, right? This power. He says in verse 7, he says, We have this treasure in jars of clay. The gospel is the treasure, the reality of Christ. Uh, on our side, living, dying on our behalf, is a treasure for us down on the inside. We have it in these jars of clay. And that's a big note, though. The gospel is not plastered out, outside somewhere, which lets me know my joy and my peace ain't outside. Mm -hmm. It's in communion with God. It's in communion, fellowship with the Word and the Spirit that resonates internally in my heart, in my soul, by what has been revealed, what is being spoken, and so we have this treasure down on the inside. And he says, this is to show that the surpassing power, and I want you to notice, that's a great word. The gospel gives us a surpassing power. A power to, surpassing means to overtake, to, to not be overwhelmed by like Whatever happens, it surpasses that. It's greater than, it's more powerful than. It gives us the surpassing power that this gospel provides, it belongs to God, it's his power, and it's not our own. We don't possess it, it runs in us and through us, 
Um, it works for us, but it is not ours. Um, he says, and I, so now this power, this is what it does. We are afflicted in every way, but we are not crushed. What that was is a matter of perspective. He said, my reality is externally, there's a lot going on, brother. <laughs> and I am afflicted. I do. What does affliction mean? How would you define affliction? Somebody said, well, what does affliction mean? Trouble? Trouble. I'm in trouble. What else? What other words can we put to affliction? Discomfort. Discomfort. Challenges. Dilemmas. I'm hard pressed. You know, I'm, 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 I'm back against the wall. I'm pushed in a corner. I'm afflicted. I got some stuff confronting me. But even though that is the reality of what's happening on the outside, look at he says, down on the inside, I'm not crushed. I just think about it. You know, uh, especially as a, as, a, as a child, young man, um, when you don't get your way, um, you get crushed. When things don't go how you want them to go, like I remember one time in Portland, uh, we was working with this cat, I forget his first name, but he played for the uh, Trailblazer, uh, something Brian. He was a, a forward for the Trailblazer, so we had hooked up with him one time at a club and said, man, let's throw a party. So we just thought we was going to make a gang of money. And, uh, we had the party set up, talked to the uh, club owner, and he was like, all right, on this night, man, y'all can have it, you know what I'm saying? Like, y'all can get the door, you know what I'm saying? I'm going to take 75% of the bar, and I'm going to get y'all 25% of the bar. Y'all don't need no money, just show up. I got the deed. So we just like, oh, it's on. We invited everybody. But we didn't know something else was happening in Portland that was bigger than our thing. Mm -hmm. So when we got there, um, coming in real happy, real joyful, thinking it's about to be over. We probably get breaded out. And it was a trickle of folks that came up in there. And I do remember the, the despair, the, the feeling of loss it, that happened. It was just like, man, I was disappointed. My, high, my expectations was here, and the reality was down here. And so I knew that feeling was a feeling of being crushed. My, my, my thoughts, man, have been crushed. And just imagine... Um, you got your own scenarios of having expectations, things don't go according to plan. There are people who live with that feeling every day. Crush time after time. Ain't ever got resurrected, ain't ever got picked up, just crush, 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 where they so low, and this is why God says, man, I must go to them places. I must go to those places without judgment. I need to go to them places with love so that I can, because listen to this, the Bible says that the law is for the lawless. The law is for the folks who have no idea. But there's some sons and daughters, man, who life has taken a hold of them. Their situation has been beating them down and oppressing them for so long. And I want them to know their father sees them. This is the reality in my mind is Exodus. Exodus, he tells Moses, I've seen you. I've heard the cry of my people. I know their affliction and their suffering. I'm going to come down and fix it, right? We're going to judge Pharaoh. We ain't going to judge my people. My people have no judgment for them. They in this situation. And just think, first of all, remember, I've always pointed to this piece as a major um, point of God's sovereignty. The reason why God's people were in Egypt is because he decreed that they would go. He told Abraham before he had any of the kids, just know the surety your seed will be slaves in a land that is not their own. But afterwards, I'm going to deliver them and they're going to come out with great substance. That was already decreed. And so God has allowed his people to take that journey, and he is the one promising, I'm going to meet them in the midst of that wilderness, that location, and I'm going to prove myself um, as the superhero in the midst of their story. And so this, this statement from Paul is, man, I'm afflicted, but I'm not crushed by what I'm going through. Right? That's perspective. He's able, listen to this, see above what he's going through. That's, um, <clears throat> that's flying in the airplane. There's moments in the airplane where the captain is like, man, the storm is rough. I can't see, right? Like, we're going to have to listen to this. Go up a little bit. Right. So we can get out of this turbulence, get away from it. So this is where his soul did. His soul said, I'm physically in the midst of this storm. But what the spirit did and the word did is took him up beyond that, that he could see a deeper reality. That this is his true location in Christ. And so he flew above that. So he says, we are afflicted, but yet not crushed. He says, um, and matter of fact, just notice how he said, 
We are afflicted in every way. So he said, it's not just one thing going on, it's multiple things. It's all angles, man. It's all sides. But we're not crushed by what we're going through. That is another note. Again, Jesus don't make you not go through stuff. He don't exempt you from stuff. He allows stuff. And he becomes our comfort in the midst of stuff. He says, we are perplexed. I'm confused by what I'm going through. I don't understand what I'm going through. I don't even understand why I'm going through what I'm going through. But you know what? I'm not driven to despair. The car stayed parked. The car stayed parked in the peace of God. The car stayed parked in the presence of God. The car stayed parked in the sovereignty of God. I'm not being driven somewhere else to where I lose my perspective. I'm staying right here on gospel way and I can see clearly from where I'm at. I'm not down in the dumps. Listen to spiritually. My spirit is still soaring up here above my circumstances though my life is going through hell and haywire um, at the very moment. Then he says this. He says, um, Perplexed, but not driven to despair. And then he says, listen, it's persecuted. I'm being attacked. I'm being assaulted. Um, but I'm not forsaken. I know he is still with me. Uh, and I, I'm being struck down. Um, stuff is actually, listen, is knocking me down. But I know ultimately I'm not destroyed. Um, this, this is that. So remember, I think I was touching a while back. I grew up, you know, part of my journey, I was on 85th, right by Castle Rock, and so, um, you know, my father may have been in prison most of my life, but, you know, there were several lessons I distinctly remember he taught me, and one was about not running from battles, right? So we was happy, we was outside playing, playing football or something, so some of my buddies in the neighborhood, some of my cousins came over, was a little bit bigger, and so they was hauling the ball and doing some other stuff, and then one of their cousins was kind of like a bully, you know what I'm saying? Kind of like, well, what you gonna do? Push it up on me. And so he pushed up on me. I, I walked in the house. I'm out of here. And my father kind of, like, I came in too early. And he kind of like, what you in the house for? He looked at me, looked outside, and he knew what was going on. And he said, you better get back out here. <laughs> he didn't even do it. Get back out here. And so that getting sent back out there was like, man, you got to deal with that. You don't run from that, and so there are moments that God teaches us how to, to deal with our challenges, to face the enemies that confront us, knowing that the reality why we can stand in the midst of it is he's actually already defeated all our enemies. All of the things that will bully our souls have already been confronted by Jesus, overcome by Jesus, put in their place by Jesus, and what he tells us to do now stand right there. Don't move, man. Stand on my word. Stand on my truth. Um, and know that I, listen to this, am with you. And so um, that's Paul's perspective um, in the midst of this dilemma. And I'm going to just cap it at 10. Always carrying in the body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. So I, one thing I'll say about that is that <clears throat> Jesus, Jesus died to, to the flesh. He died to worldly ambitions. He died to even what people thought he should do in certain circumstances. Like he didn't live out to try to prove himself or he should have did this. Remember they told him, well, if you be the son of God, get us down from here and yourself. Like kind of prove yourself. He died to those things, listen to this, so he could live to God. Like he gave up on the worldly ambition trying to get himself out of the tough spots that the will of God called him into. And he maintained his godly perspective, knowing clearly who God was, what he was to do on his behalf, and he stood right there in the face of trial and dilemma. And so this, again, is what Christ is after, not telling us, but teaching us. Telling can be without experience. You can sit in the class, hear a gang of stuff, but you ain't ever experienced that a day in your life. But he says, now, I'm gonna get you in the class, I'm gonna say it, but I got to take you through life so I can teach that, and that could be the witness um, that lives in your soul. So, so that is coming out of Peter, walking on water, giving power to do um, what is impossible for a human to do, and then Paul kind of capturing that with a godly perspective um, in the midst of.